This is Family Twist, a podcast about astonishing adoption stories and finding family via DNA magic. I'm Kendall. And I'm Corey. And we've been inseparable partners in life since 03, 04, 05, also known as March 4th, 2005. In January 2018, our found family journey took us 3,000 miles from the San Francisco Bay Area to New England, where we now live near my biological father, two half-siblings, and their families. We love being near them all, and the adventure continues. Thank you for joining us again on Family Twist. Unfortunately, Kendall is not with us today. He's dealing with some work drama, so it's just me, I'm afraid, but I'm very excited because our guest is Shayna Landry, a forensic genealogist and private investigator, also known as a DNA detective. Now, you might have seen Shayna on Netflix's I Just Killed My Dad, where she used her DNA expertise to assist the investigation. Welcome, Shayna. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Before we talk about the Netflix show and everything else, I want to start off with the fact that you did an Ancestry DNA test about six or seven years ago? Yep. In 2016. Okay. And what was the impetus for that? So all my life, I knew that my father that raised me was my stepfather. Um, I knew that he, he adopted me when I was younger. And so I was, I was really curious about where I came from and who I was. Um, and my mom gave me a name. And actually, <laughs> my detective work started when I was a freshman in high school. I guess Google had, Google, I guess, wasn't even a thing at the point, that point. It was Yahoo, maybe, or White Pages. And I found the man that she said was my father. And I looked him up. He lived about 15 minutes away. So I contacted him and he said, I don't think I'm your dad. I just, I can't, I can't, I couldn't make the timelines add up. I don't think it's me. And, um, but he had, he had kept a photo my mom had given him when I was a baby. And so I didn't believe him, to be honest with you. I just thought maybe he just didn't want children. He married someone who couldn't have children so, or, or maybe they just decided not to have children. But In any case, I decided he just didn't want to be a dad. So I went on about my life. Um, A few years later, I reached out to his mother to see if she wanted to meet me or know about me. And she was curious, but didn't continue beyond the phone call. Um, And then came the Ancestry DNA. I guess it was like an ad through a DJ on the local radio station. And I figured out that you could connect with family members. And I was like, well, here's my chance. You know, I don't need his DNA to prove that he's my father. Um, The funny thing was that when I got the DNA back, it was very clear that he was not my father. And he was right. Mm. I did call him and apologize. (laughs) Um, So then that led me to looking for my actual father those initial results like what popped up for you so I had learned a little bit through Facebook at that point um this was 2016 so DNA was hotter at that time than it had been and so there were Facebook groups of people trying to figure out how to work with the DNA and and others who were really good at it that were helping them and so I knew pretty quickly that the man that my mom had said was my father which was her on again, off again, college boyfriend was not my father because I was very lucky that he was not from Louisiana and all of my matches were from Louisiana and specifically on my paternal side, New Orleans. Um, And then my mom's side, they're all from Cajun country, which is the the total opposite side of the state. So, um, so it was, it was really clear thankfully, like I said, that he, his parents were from other states and I had, I had right. no matches that were even remotely from out of state. So gotcha. it was pretty obvious. So did you start reaching out to some of the people you matched with or how did you go about that process? So my dad was very Italian. Um, and I don't know how much you guys have dove into this, but, um, a lot of other countries don't test yet, or maybe they do, but they're not using Ancestry. 
So at the time I had no idea, but um, I, I, I had very few matches on his side. My mom's side, I had tons, um, but on his side, I had very few. The closest match I had, and I'm going to speak a little bit of genealogy here, was um, like 236 centimorgans, which um, might not mean anything to anyone, but uh, it, it, what it means is it, she ended up being my grandmother's first cousin on my father's side. And then the next one down was 77 centimorgans, which was much farther removed. Um, and I did reach out to the first lady, but she was much older and wasn't using Ancestry. Um, so I did some more detective work and ended up speaking to her 97-year-old mother. <laughs> and she was like, you need to call my other daughter. And so I did. And um, at first, she was like, I didn't do my DNA. I don't want any part of this. But uh Luckily, thankfully, she had a change of heart and, and she and her husband called me back the next day and gave me information on my family um, and how she could possibly be related to me. Mm, okay. Wow. So, yeah, just to sort of clarify, I mean, if you're we're talking about, a, uh, you know, a, a parent or a sibling, thousands. Thousands, of, you know, right. Yes, as opposed to just single or double digits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so that would have been. Had, I don't know if you knew, you know, what those numbers meant back then, but yeah, I would have been I did not. To, get, <laughs> to get those kind of numbers. Back. Yes. And, and back then we were still using the charts. They didn't have the tools that they have now. So you couldn't just, you right. know, type a number in. We were still using the charts, like trying to figure out what that number meant. And I mean, even now trying to use the chart, that number couldn't almost fit anywhere because it's so low. Right, right. So you've gotten some clues from a distant family member. And where do you go from there? I was, so the 77 Cinnamorgan match, she actually had my biological father's last name, which was Segreto, and it's pretty unique. So mm -hmm. I looked her up, and she happened to be my age, and we had a mutual friend. So I reached out to the mutual friend and I said, Hey, listen, I know. And he was actually more of an acquaintance to me. So I probably sounded crazy, but <laughs> um, I was like, listen, I know this sounds crazy, but can you please ask her to check her Facebook messages? So he did and she did thankfully. And she basically just told me who her dad was. She wasn't super close to the family. Um, her dad passed when she was very young and so she didn't have a ton of information, but um, she was helpful as far as like who the family was and who their parents were. So I started researching the lady, the older lady's family on the other side. Um, and I, I stumbled across my grandmother's obituary and she was married to a man with the Segreto last name. And so it's funny because her last name was Smith, her maiden name. So it was like a needle in a haystack. And then I've got this super right. unique name. So it was really easy to find her because of her obituary. And then she had two sons and I was, the names were staring back at me. So it was, uh, it was a, a wild ride for a second there. And then it was like, the answer was in my lap. Wow. Were you nervous about reaching out or what, what, what were you feeling at that moment? Oh man. Oh, here it is. So I was at that time, I was very concerned about blowing someone's life up because I knew that whoever, whichever brother it was, didn't know that I existed. So it was possible that he was in a relationship at the time or married with children now. And I didn't want to, I just wanted to know where I came from and who I was. I didn't need necessarily a father. I had a father who raised me, um, but I did want to know like what could have been or, or what should have been. And, and to know if he, if I had siblings or anything about my, right. my genetic past or my biology. So I started looking at them and my uncle at the time, I didn't know he was my uncle, but he was born the same year as my mom. So I jumped 
on that, I was like, it's got to be him. They're the same age. Uh, my father was a couple of years older. He would have been a senior the year my mom was a freshman when she got pregnant with me. Um, so I, I thought it was my uncle at first, but then I started doing a little more research and he had graduated from the University of New Orleans and my mom was from uh, Baton Rouge. So that didn't jive. <laughs> and luckily my my dad had one Facebook post that I could see of all of his posts. And it was from when Prince died. He had posted a Prince ticket and it was from, I think, 1985. But someone commented that they remember the drive back to Southeastern, which is the college that they went to, and how it was so bad. It was icy on the roads or something of that nature. And I was like, bingo, it's him. He was there. Um, I asked my mom, and she she confirmed that there was a John. Oh, boy. Yeah. The prince was the key. Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> Thank goodness for Prince. Well, he got right. to see some amazing uh, vintage prints if he saw them in 1985. Right. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. So, you know who your dad is and he's on Facebook. Is that how you reached out or? No, his Facebook said he was in California. So, I was a little nervous that he wasn't even in the state. Um, and again, I didn't want to blow up his life. So, I thought I'll reach out to my uncle and see. Um, and even my uncle, I didn't want to call him at home either. So I, he owned a local gym in New Orleans. So I called the gym and left a message. And when I tell you this is the most amazing human being on the planet, I mean, he is the most wonderful person I know. Thank goodness. Um, and he, he called me back and we spoke and he answered all of my questions. I asked if he was married, if he had children. Um, and it's funny cause I'll never forget. He said, just you. Um, so he immediately <laughs> believed me and was, um, excited to talk to me. So it was really nice to have that open reception because, um, you know, I'm very fortunate as a lot of people do not get that from the family when they find them. So right. I was very lucky. Right. Um, and he did give me his phone number. Did he give you any kind of sense as to like what he thought your dad's reaction would be or? He said, <laughs> um, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. He said, please don't tell him you got my phone. You're his phone number from me. <laughs> and I said, okay, this is a red flag. <laughs> um, right. Because, you know, the person I just spoke to for like 45 minutes, I guess, was wonderful. And I thought, well, he's got to be similar to him. Um, but when he said that, I was like, uh, is he going to be upset? And he said, no, I think he'll be excited, but he's also going to be, you know, he can be kind of rough around the edges. And I, so I was prepared when I called him for someone who might be a little more harsh than what I had just encountered. Okay. Okay. And, uh, how did that first phone call go? <laughs> so I called him on my lunch break. And I said, hi, you know, and I didn't know, was he working? You know, he might be on his lunch break as well. Um, and so I, I was trying to make it quick, but I was also trying to be pretty like um, business-like because my uncle had said, you know, he didn't marry or have children because his whole life had been about his career. So I was trying to be very like, you know, I don't know, more business than all feelings and emotions. So I sure. said, you know, hi, I'm, I'm looking for John Segreto. And he said, speaking. And I said, um, okay, do you have a second? And he was like, I, he was like, what do you want? And I was like, <laughs> whoa. And I'm sure he, maybe he thought I was a telemarketer or something at that point. Right. Um, but I was like, well, to be quite frank with you, I think you're my father. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> he said, uh, who is your mother? And I thought, well, I have about five seconds to spit out exactly what I know to be true about my mom in 1986. So I, you know, I said she was a tiny blonde girl who likely ran cross country. You might've met her at a bar. I don't know. She was at Southeastern. And he said, what was her name? And I said her name. And he said, I know exactly who your mom is. And I was like, whoa, because I, I did not expect him to say that he knew who she was. I mean, 
it would be so easy just to deny. Sure. Um, and he said, yeah, we dated. And I was shocked because my mom said that it was more of a one-time thing. Yeah. So um, he heard the shock in my voice and he was, you know, questioning why I was so shocked. And I said, well, she told me it was, it was less than dating. And he said, he, I don't know, he was just so angry that that was how it was told to me. And that, you know, then he started to realize, I think that he had missed 30 years of my life. Yeah. Um, so that started to sink in and he, he just got angrier and angrier as we talked. Wow. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> just hurt, hurt that it was like that his, you know, that what he perceived as a relationship was chalked up to a one night stand. No big exactly. Deal. Yes. And then, wow. you know, a lot of what ifs and, and the fact that he didn't have a family his entire life, um, or, you know, any significant relationships beyond his parents. Um, wow. And that it had been taken, you know. So how do you penetrate that anger to get beyond that? <sighs> he, um, so he asked me for a couple of days to digest the information. And of course, you know, I've been knowing that I have a father out there my entire life, but he didn't know he had a child out there. So, however, I was like, okay, like how long is this going to take? Yes, I'll give you a couple of days. Um, <laughs> but it ended up being a little longer than that. And, and by the weekend, I guess, I was ready to talk. I wanted to know. Um, so I sent him a photo of me and I was like, look, this is me. I'm not even sure, like, I'm not even 100% sure, you know. And honestly, to be fair, I wasn't 100% sure until I had that paternity test. Like, even though yeah. he had told me that he had had a relationship with my mom, he confirmed all of it. But I, I didn't, I didn't believe it until that DNA test came back. But um, so he, he reached, I reached out to him again that, that, that weekend and I sent him a photo and he said, look, you know, when the time is right. And then he called me later that day and he was like, look, I'm all or nothing. I really just need to get this like, I just need to digest this. And then I promise you, like, I'm 100% like all in. And he said, you know, I saw that photo and you're my twin. It looks like I spit you out. And I was like, okay, oh. like, can I get one? <laughs> I right. wanted to yeah. see him. And so um, we get off the phone and it sounded, I was hopeful and excited. And then he called me back about 15 minutes later. And he said, one last thing, how'd you get my number? Oh, uh, and <laughs> oh I had promised my uncle that I wouldn't say. And so I was like, well, I mean, like technically I could have looked it up, but at the time I wasn't very savvy with buying phone numbers or using any, all of these search engines. And so I was like, I got it offline. And he was like, you, someone gave you my personal cell phone number online. And I was like, Ugh. and he said, <laughs> he said, you got it from my brother, didn't you? And I, I just sat there and he said, I knew it. And he hung up the phone. Well, unbeknownst to me, he blocked me at that oh. moment in anger. Yes. Um, so I didn't know because at the time, you know, like it was right when iPhone started going to like green, if it was blocked or whatever. And I had no idea. Um, so I just kept texting him like every couple of weeks and <laughs> it was going into nowhere. Um, I continued a relationship with my uncle. He said, just give him some time to cool down. And uh, so I continued with my uncle and we ended up having lunch in New Orleans. And he was, again, wonderful. He's just been so great. And so then um, a few months later, I figured out that I was blocked and I was given a photo of him by a friend of mine whose dad went to school with him. It was very strange. Uh, and so he sent me a side by side of us. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, he wasn't kidding. I am his twin. So I decided to download a text app and I texted him with the photo and I was like, I got this off Google because <laughs> I had seen the photo a million times. I just didn't know that it was him. Wow. Um, wow. And I said, uh, 
we do look alike. And he said, yes, we do. And I'd like to know you when the time is right. And this is in like August. We, I found him in June. So um, it was like a month or two later. And so I was like, okay, he wants to talk now. So we just kept talking on the text app until November. And then things changed. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I found out, you know, what happened when I saw that, I mean, my, my heart just sank like, Oh, this is not the, this is not where you want the story to go. No. Yeah. So, um, in November, November 19th, it was a Friday. He contacted me and I had kept the conversation very, very business-like. We only talked about my career. Um, at the time I was being offered promotions and, and, um, new jobs in other cities. And he was giving me advice about not doing things like that because that's how he ended up where he was and things like that. So I just, I didn't talk about family. I didn't talk about anything that I thought might bring back those angry emotions. And so, um, in November, he reached out to me and he called that text app and I was like, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to unblock me if you want to talk to me. So he did. Um, and he started telling me that, um, he, his house was up for sale and it was under contract and, um, he needed, he was in a bind and he was wondering if he could borrow some cash to like get him through. And I had just adopted my daughter. I was a single mom. I adopted her from foster care. And so I wasn't really in the position to give anyone money at the time. Like, I mean, daycare is a, a full mortgage payment. I mean, if we're being. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. Yes, absolutely. Know, and on a single income, you know, so I was very fortunate that that particular day, I had a lot of like um, very interesting divine intervention situations that came, went along with mm. this. But um, that particular day, I had a ring for sale and consignment for two years and it actually sold that day. And so I had money, <laughs> crazy enough. And so I didn't know what to do. I was like, what if he's scamming me? What if, you know, he's just using me? So I called one of my friends and, and um, he said, look, a couple hundred bucks is a small price to pay to know if this guy is um, genuine or not. And, and you can kind of just walk away if, if, that's, if that's all you lose. And I sure. said, he's right. So I gave him the money. And immediately it's like the wall fell down. He was amazing. Like he, he called me all weekend. He, he reached out constantly and, and I was like, wow, this is all it took. <laughs> but um, I think it just established that trust and, and it showed him that I was invested too. Um, right. It was, yeah. It, 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 it's something different for everybody, right? You know, it, yeah. A few bucks. Like, right. Oh, okay. She's right. Legit. Yeah. And so um that following week was thanksgiving week so i kind of pushed a little bit and i said you know i don't have anything to do thanksgiving night why don't my daughter and i come up and see you because we lived about an hour and 15 minutes or so away so i said why don't we come over and, and say hi and bring you some thanksgiving dinner and he said i'm just not ready maybe christmas and i said okay i resigned myself to it so we were um, chatting up till Thanksgiving day. I sent him pictures of my baby and her little Thanksgiving outfit. And she, he talked about how cute she was and everything was great. And then all of a sudden those dreaded green bubbles came back from the iPhone. And I said, oh no, he blocked me again. Why? Like this doesn't make sense. Right. Yeah. Everything was going well. Yeah. And so um, I kind of left the ball in his court and I thought, okay, well, I mean, I guess this is it, you know, maybe my friend was right. And so um, that was Thursday. And then on Tuesday, the following Tuesday, um, well, actually a, a week and a half later. So the next Tuesday, um, one of my good friends and I were on the phone and she said, let me call him. And she said, if, if it does, cause I, so I started to be concerned that maybe he hadn't paid his phone bill. And so maybe I just needed to pay his phone bill. Um, sure. but she said, let me see if it's disconnected for me. And if it is, then, you know, and if it's not, then 
we know. She said, but if he answers, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> and um, he didn't. And so I reached out to my uncle and I said, listen, I think we need to do a wellness check because he had mentioned to me that he had high blood pressure and, you know, that he could pass any day. And, Ooh. and I, and he was only 52. And so I dismissed that very quickly. I, I was like, I don't, I mean, at the time I didn't know anything about blood pressure, but I was like, I think they make pills for that. <laughs> like you're very young and I don't want to consider the fact that you could pass. And so, um, I, I did tell my uncle that there, I said, look, he's been kind of ill, which I guess I should have said earlier. I mean, it, maybe it's been obvious, but they didn't speak. So, um, he, my uncle wouldn't have known that. So right. He, I said, look, I think we should have the sheriff's office do a wellness check because I didn't want to get my uncle involved if it was just him being angry again. Or, and I didn't want to put myself in a situation. So I thought maybe just, you know, one, one degree of separation here. So my uncle said, I'll call you in the morning. And I said, okay. So the next morning I couldn't wait. And I thought, wait a second, he was under contract for that house. The realtor has talked to him. I mean, there's just no way that he hadn't gotten in contact with her. So I called the realtor. Big mistake. I was driving to work and I said, um, hi, I'm calling to talk to you about the house on Gillen Street is where he lived. And and she said, "Uh, um, what would you like to know about it? And I said, I'd like to talk to you about your client. And she said, which one, the buyer or the seller? And I said, the seller. And she said, ma'am, the seller is dead. And when I tell you, I almost drove into a wall. (laughs) It was the worst day of my life to date I can assure you I was Uh, devastated and Uh, to find um, out that way right oh my gosh definitely a very hard I got to work and they immediately sent me home they were like you cannot be here like this um and I, I text my uncle and I was like he's dead like what you know cause she said uh she said he told me she said who is this and I said this is his daughter. And she said, what is going on? He told me he didn't have any family and now he has a daughter and a brother. And I was stunned because that told me that my uncle knew. Um, And so I was a little upset about that, but there are other, there were other things at play. My uncle had had his first child two days prior to my dad passing. So he had a newborn Um, And then he was having to deal with all of this and his own, you know, um, emotions and and the situation that he was in. So, and then having to tell me, yeah, right. And then having to consider telling me after everything we had been through together, you know, I, I can't imagine the place that he was in. And so I have no, I have no anger or I I have no issue with any, any way that he handled it. Um, He's been, he's been wonderful 100% of this entire time. So um, he immediately called the funeral home. Um, Well, the first thing he told me was I had the coroner's office take blood for you so that we can do a paternity test. And I was like, wow, like anyone else would have, I mean, they could have, cremated him and been done like that. And I would have never known. Um, and I said, okay, well, do you think we could do a different kind? Like if I paid a lab to come in and swab him because that, you know, corners with the blood could take weeks. Um, and I need, I needed to know at that point, like I just really needed to know. And so he said, absolutely no problem. He, the coroner's office was bringing my dad to the funeral home that day. And so he went to the funeral home immediately and turned everything over to me as next of kin. Um, he told them I would handle everything. Uh, he, <laughs> this man is a rock star. He sat in as executor to the estate for my father. He insisted that I be put in as his heir. Um, I mean, you're just a, an amazing human. And, and I, at the time, was having immense feelings of guilt, and I didn't want any of that. But he insisted. He was like, 
my brother would have wanted you to, you know, he, he wanted to make sure that he knew that I was taken care of. And it, it was just um, an unbelievable time for me. Um, he made sure that the Thank court you. deemed him my father. It was amazing. Wow. I mean, I can, I can only imagine like all the feelings that you were going through and, you know, and, and, you know, doing this podcast and being part of a lot of Facebook groups, you know, you just, you, you see and read the heartbreaking stories and, you know, but it's just, they, they, they're becoming more and more common. And I think a lot of people, I think most people in your position, their gut would be like, oh, I wish I had never done a DNA test. I don't want anything to do with DNA ever again. And that is not the case with you. This is really no. the beginning of the story. It was the beginning, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, after that, I, I mean, I had a newborn at the time, so I was spending a lot of time at home. And probably not the best way to deal with trauma, but I did dive into other people's DNA mysteries, it helped me to help them. And it still does to this day. <laughs> Every time I'm able to give someone their answers, it kills a little piece of my broken heart. And so that that's helpful for me, you know. That's just amazing. Uh, where do you think your detective like instincts come from? That's a good question. Um, I have on my mom's side, I have law enforcement background. Okay. So I'm assuming it's that. Um, my uncle was uh, a captain in the sheriff's office and now he's chief investigator at the coroner's office so maybe I get my detective's nose from him <laughs> <laughs> how do you how did you get from that point of you know grieving um your father and then deciding and I want to help other people and how do you even get involved with helping other people with their DNA mysteries I think it all goes back to those Facebook groups. Um, you know, people would go on there and I could see them pleading for help and they didn't know what they were looking at. And I thought, well, let me take a crack at it. I'm just sitting at home, you know, not sleeping. So <laughs> I would spend late hours just diving into people's DNA. And I'll never forget my first client. She was devastated. Um, you know, to find out most of my clients were much older when they found out. So, and, and most of them had the shock, right? I, I had a shock, but in a different way. A lot of people that I work with don't know that their father isn't their father at all. Um, right. The man that raised them, you know, I am in a unique situation that that man didn't raise me. It didn't break my heart the way it genuinely breaks some of these people's hearts you know um and then moving into the adoptive realm where um i know kendall knew from day one that he was adopted but so many people yes. so many of my current clients are adoptees who found out in their 40s 50s 60s that they were adopted and i cannot imagine the amount of betrayal that it must feel that you know the two people that are you're supposed to be able to trust and, and love you the most could keep those things from you. So um, being able to give people a little bit of their past and, and where they come from is, you know, it's just healing for me too. Sure. What are some of your tools of the trade? Oh, man. So first and foremost would have to be my ADHD, my hyperfocus. <laughs> I'll have to All right, great. give that a little shout out. But um after that, you know, um, I 1000% prefer ancestry DNA. So um, if my client has not tested there, I always recommend that they do. And then also, you know, so using ancestry and the tools that it provides, such as the trees and be able to connect the trees to the DNA and let it do its magic that way. Um, and then also they added the colored bubbles, which is awesome because I used to have to do that myself. Um, and then also I use something called DNA Jedcom, which um, it's, it is the Leeds method, but it's the Collins Leeds method. Um, some people may be familiar with the Leeds method, but a lot of people do that by hand. So it's just a, it's a triangulation of uh, 
and grandparents and great grandparents. So it basically groups people together based on their great grandparents and how they're related. Um, however, DNA GEDCOM, it's amazing. It's a $5 donation a month, I believe. And it will actually extract the DNA and all of the trees and all the people that are in common with each other and make a little chart for you. And then it'll tell you who they share in common as far as the ancestors in their tree. So that is like my secret weapon. A lot of people don't know about it and don't use it, but it's awesome. awesome. Um, and then DNA Painter, I spent a lot of time using all of the tools on DNA Painter, um, mostly the Wado trees though. Um, and that is the, what are the odds? So you put the tree in, you put the people that you match and their cinnamon organs, and it basically tries to triangulate and give you an, a, a hypothesis of where you could potentially fit in. Okay. Now at the beginning you were, you were on the groups and you were seeing people that were looking for help and you were reaching out to them. Is that still how you get your clients or are there people that are referring folks to you or how does it work these days? Yeah. So the Netflix was a huge, um, bump for me as far as clients yeah. go. Um, prior to the Netflix, I was probably working like three or four cases at a time and I was doing most of them pro bono or for a donation. Uh, now, because of the Netflix, I do have to charge because I just can't, I'm working full time. I also have a nonprofit for foster children. I am maxed out on the amount of availability that I have. And so I did sure. start charging after Netflix because I did have a ton of interest. It was very interesting to me that people heard one sentence in that Netflix and it was that I had found my father via DNA and they reached out to me because that it had never crossed my it's I've listened I've watched tons of of documentaries and I never thought like I should reach out to this person. But so right. many people were like, listen, I turned it off after I heard what you said and like I immediately went and searched for you and I was like, wow, like I I couldn't imagine feeling so isolated and stuck and not know where to go that I hear this on a documentary and I immediately stop my life and go. Um, so I'm glad that they did, but yes, things have gone insane since then. And I did this weekend get my first referral from a client from Netflix. So I solved hers and I guess she reached out and told someone about me and that person is now a new client. Awesome. Have you thought about like, or do you want to turn this into your full-time thing? I would love to. Um, I started out this last six months with a, an extremely low price for what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, compared to most others that do this for a living, I'm charging about 10%. Um, I do look to increase my prices so that I can go full time, but it was important to me to keep accessibility for people who can't afford those outstanding prices. Um, don't get me wrong they are worth every penny um, because, you know, what the information that we're giving to people is life-changing. Um, yes. And it does take a lot of hard work and dedication to get to that point. But like I said, you know, it was important to me to give as many people as possible um, access to my expertise right now while I can do that. But um, I do look to be increasing my prices in the very near future so that I can spend more quality time on my clients. Sure. And, you know, I'm sure you're finding things out that, you know, of course, everybody wants a happy ending, but I'm sure you're finding information that's not a happy ending for people. And you've got to be able to share that with them. And I'm sure you're doing it with a lot more decorum than the real estate agent uh, had. With yeah. You. Yeah, um, so that is definitely something I did not take into account was the emotional roller coaster that it would be for me. Um, you know, I explained to my clients in our first uh, call when we speak about their case that, you know, this is an emotional roller coaster and you're going to have ups and downs and it doesn't matter what the ending is, if it's happy or sad, it's still going to be a roller coaster. And <laughs> I didn't take my own advice. Um, I didn't realize how attached I would become to my clients and you know, because I, I become a part of their family. I'm, I'm digging into their past. I'm learning about their family. And so their story becomes a little piece of my story 
And, um, you know, it does, it does definitely take a toll when it's a sad ending. Um, I cry with my clients, I laugh with my clients and, and honestly, after it's all said and done, we walk away most of the time with some sort of friendship because they may need to call on me even after their case is solved um, because they don't, everyone in our case, for the most part, is on an island. The, yeah. Their friends and their family don't know. They don't understand what they're going through. Right, right. Well, I've got a couple of questions for you about a couple of things you posted on Facebook that really made me smile. But before we get to that, <laughs> let's let's talk a little bit about how you got involved with the murder investigation. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was a uh, drug into that investigation, kicking and screaming at first. My, um, at the time, this is a very short version of this. Uh, my husband was on furlough whenever this all went down. Um, he works for the federal government. And so one of his coworkers was also on furlough. And at the time he was the Dave Ramsey fanatic. So um, I don't know if you're familiar, but if you work for the federal government and you're on furlough, you do not get paid during furlough. So they were on furlough for several weeks at that time in 2019. And so um, the coworker picked up a second job and that was at Clegg's at the nursery that Anthony Thompson was working at. So he was there that entire time. And when they came back from furlough, um, this is one thing the documentary kind of was off on. It was the dates um, because it looked like I jumped right in as soon as this happened, but that wasn't the case. It was about a month later. Um, so Anthony was, in jail for a while and and so elena was beating on every door trying to speak to anyone who would listen at that point um and so they had gotten back from furlough and my husband makes them like sit around the table and kind of share what they do like even after the weekend so they had a lot to talk about and they were um all aware of they're aware of my nonprofit, which works with foster children who are usually um you know abused or neglected in some way and then they're also aware of my story with my DNA. So they, the coworkers immediately, once they heard what had happened um, while the other coworker was at Clegg's, they, um, they were like, you got, we need to call Shayna. So they all called me from the conference room on speakerphone and were like, can you help this kid? And I was like, what do you guys think I'm going to do? And I was like, it just sounds like, you know, this spoiled kid that shot his dad. I don't understand. And um, so they said, please just talk to this lady. And that was Elena. And luckily, luckily for Anthony, Elena, I just really loved her. Um, and I thought, you know what? She had, she had, she might be onto something um, with all of the things she had brought to the table. I couldn't ignore it. So I said, Elena, you know, I'm going to look into this. And that was on a Monday. And by Thursday, we had um, Anthony's sister and mom on the phone. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was crazy. That's just, <laughs> that is wild. That is wild. Yeah. Well, I encourage everybody to to check out uh, the Netflix series. It's It's pretty amazing. And you know, I could just tell, you know, from just from the little bit that you're in there and, you know, reading about you and reading some of your Facebook posts, it's like, oh man, this is a really good person. I'm really oh. looking forward to speaking with her. You're so sweet. And so, you know, a couple of your recent Facebook posts get into some stuff that I think is really important when people are, you know, just making these discoveries and reaching out to family. And, and as you said, it's like, you know, it's, you're uh, potentially rocking somebody's world. You know, but at the same time, on the flip side, the person who's doing the rocking has has felt sometimes a lifetime of of want and need and stuff. So it's mm -hmm. like they can't kind of help themselves. So, what kind of advice do you have for both the person who's doing the knocking and the person who's getting knocked upon? Oh man! So I'm a a huge believer in the fact that you can never have too much family. Um, mm -hmm. My daughter is adopted, but I did her DNA when she was three, um, just so that she would always have that connection to her biological family. 
Um, and I reached out to her family. We have extra Christmas days added in for places we have to go because we go and, and spend with her family. Um, because wow. I, I never want her to not know or for it to, to be taboo or her for her to feel like this is a shock to her. She's only seven. Um, and she does understand, but you know, I think with time she'll understand even more. Um, so that's always been my thing is that, you know, you're, you're not having to give anything up by accepting someone into your family. You know, um, I think that those people deserve to know where they come from at the very least, you know, information about themselves as far as medical, um, you know, a lot of the pushback we see is from people who are either embarrassed by the situation or um, sometimes the the children. So maybe like a sibling to the person who's having the revelations, um, they will try to protect their parent from this information. But, you know, every everyone has a right to know if they have a child out there. Um, or vice versa, they have they they have a right to know their parent, and I think that those people should be able to make those decisions. But also, you know, if you are the parent, please just have an open mind and and at least give them basic information and answer their questions. It doesn't have to go beyond one conversation. Um, they might not give up like me, but <laughs> but you know just being open and honest with them after the one conversation and giving them some closure. I think most people would be okay with that. Um, Almost all of my clients would be. Um, But to the, the person looking, you know, I always tell my clients if it is a negative reaction that, you know, whatever happened for you to come about, it wasn't an accident. Um, no matter what anyone says, you were meant to be here and, and those people don't define you and their actions don't define you. Um, at the end of the day, you and your actions define you. So we can find as much information as possible. And I, I try to give them, I do more than just hand over, like, here's a name. I will do in-depth research on these people so that they know what they're getting into But also, if that's all they get, then they have more than just a name. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know until we started talking just now that you you fostered and then adopted your daughter. That's kudos to you for doing that. And you know, there's a few episodes. (laughs) Oh, twice. Oh, excellent. That's that's amazing. Um, A handful of episodes ago, you know, Kendall and I introduced the the idea that we're looking into you know fostering. And, and maybe adoption as well. So we're, you know, we're kind of doing the research and stuff. Now, mm-hmm. so. I saw that and I, and I was like, it's... wow, <laughs> that's awesome. I, I think, thank you. Um, and I just, I think it's wonderful what, what you did for your daughter, you know, doing the DNA test and, and getting her so she can have a, you know, a potential relationship with her, her family. That's wow. Yeah. I wasn't expecting to, to hear that. So it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling all over. Right <laughs> well, and, and unfortunately both of her parents passed um, in the last two years. So oh. it was even more important to establish those relationships with her siblings and, yes. um, you know, keeping her connected. Right. Right. Well, it's interesting, you know, when we started this, this podcast, we didn't really, have a great sense of what the whole found family, the DNA, you know, community was like. And it's, it's actually a lot larger than I would have guessed, you know, a couple of years ago. And it's growing because I think, you know, more and more people are, you know, taking that leap and, you know, they're getting DNA tests for Christmas and here it is, you know, February. So there might be starting to do getting ready to do their research. You probably are getting get an influx of uh, people reaching out to you. <laughs> I have actually soon. been waiting on pins and needles because I feel that that giant ancestry sale that they had, that they it went on for a very long time. I keep telling my clients, like, just waiting for them all to hit because right. they might be the key to some of my clients' answers, you know? So right. I have been yeah. patiently anticipating all of these to process. <laughs> <laughs> are you still at 100% uh, success rate for your clients? 
I am now. I do have some in a holding pattern right now, but I do not give, sure. I don't give up. So I just yeah. tell my clients, you know, we might be on pause for a second, but sure. I don't, I don't take a client on if it's impossible. And there's been maybe two people that I said, look, I think it's just best to wait. Um, yeah. But I give them guidelines, you know, when you see a match above 200 centimorgans pop up, give me a call and we're going to go back to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, you know, as we see, you know, the community grow and more people, um, you know, looking for their family, I'm sure it's going to make you busier, but I, I definitely think just speaking with you and, and learning a little bit about you, like there's a TV show here with you. I don't know <laughs> if that's something you've thought about, but there is definitely something, you know, and it's, of course, it's not going to always be good news. It's going to be, there's going to be some heartbreak there, but you know, there's, I think there's definitely an audience for a show for what you do and, and your story. It's, it's really remarkable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've thought about it, you know, my clients, man, some of them have some very interesting stories and I think they need to be told because I think that there are other people out there in similar situations that could really, um, use the, the camaraderie, I guess, you know, like just, just to know that they're not alone. Um, because right. you know, a lot of my clients come to me because they know that I understand how they feel, but even more so to know that there are other people out there that also get it, you know, it's just kind of a private matter. So you can't really, you know, a lot of people aren't shouting that from the rooftops. Right. Right. Well, yeah, we definitely found out that, you know, you, when you jump in with all four feet immediately, <laughs> like you don't necessarily you know, it's yeah. be a shock to the system, but you know, this podcast has been, you know, healing for Kendall and I, I can you know, imagine. as we've gone on this journey and, and getting to know people, you know, who have gone through similar experiences and completely different experiences and all of the stories are great and they're all worth being told. So it's, it's definitely been a worthwhile en endeavor and I'm so glad that, um, that I found you to be yeah, part of me this too. because it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's great. And I just, you know, it's, I love what you're doing. I love that you didn't take that devastation and close it up in your heart, you know, that you actually used it for heal for healing yourself and, and helping so many other people. Yeah. It's been, it's definitely been a great journey. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking some time and, and sharing your story. Thanks for having me. It's been really great. <laughs> Family Twist features original music from Cosmic Afterthoughts and is presented by Savoir Faire Marketing Communications.